Hello, my lovely friends. Jan of Jan Hicks Creates here, coming at you with floss tube number 135. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you've had a lovely couple of weeks. Um, welcome to any new subscribers. I hope you enjoy yourself here and enjoy a lot of eye candy, a little craziness, usually some silliness, you never know, um, and lots of stitching. Um, little life update, just to say I don't really have anything to update. Um, nothing for Mike on that job, the first job offer that is still at a standstill. He cannot get an answer from anybody on what the problem is. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just ridiculous. The job that he had the interview for that Monday after my last video went well. It was basically just a preliminary talk with the woman he will be working for, he may be working for, um, just to get a feel for whether he would be a fit for the team. She thought he would, so he has a follow-up formal interview on the 30th, which includes a paper and a presentation of that paper. Um, and then he will find out within two weeks after the 30th whether they are going to hire him or not. So, no news really to report at all, except that we're still sitting here. We have plans for July 4th to go up to Waco. Um, I'm excited about that. Maria Kutzner is going to be coming down from the Dallas area to um, to visit. Um, I have something in the works with her, or I should say she has something in the works with me because she's really the, the moving power behind this idea. Hopefully we will be able to share that with you probably in August, I'm thinking, although we haven't really discussed a time frame yet. Um, but there is a, a national monument there called the Ma in, in the Waco area called the Mammoth National Monument where mammoths roamed the earth. Um, so I think that's gonna be kind of cool to see. And of course, we're gonna to go to Magnolia. Um, Maria and I are going to go to the cross stitch store in Copperas Cove, so I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, that's over the 4th of July weekend, so we're looking forward to that. And hopefully, not long after that, we will find out about this job. So other than that, lots of stitching, lots of purchasing. Um, in today's video, I am going to be showing you um, work on a couple new designs. I have my tips and tricks segment. I have a let's go shopping segment. We haven't done that in a while. And I have haul. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, all right, let me, let me look at my notes. I have notes this time, so that must mean something, right? <laughs> Maybe I have my act together a little bit more. Maybe there was just enough going on that I felt I needed to take notes. I don't know. Anyways, um, I wanted to thank all of you for your input on my idea for a Scottish sampler. sampler. Many of you gave me some great ideas to, to work with. Um, I'm really kind of surprised, and maybe I shouldn't be, but maybe I just don't know history well enough, um, at how many, number one, how many of you actually have Scottish ancestors? Number two, how many of them actually came over to the United States around the same time as my grandmother? And again, maybe it's just there was just an influx at that point in time, um, I don't know. But anyways, there is a lot of interest in me doing a Scottish sampler, so um, I will. I am not going to be getting started on that just yet. I did order that book I told you about, um, Embellished Stories, I believe is the name. I ordered it from Amazon. It is a book on a sampler exhibition that took, back, took place in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, I think in 2019. And so these are all um, samplers that 
a, a particular woman who wrote this book has collected, I think she's like over 200 or 400, some astronomical number of samplers in her collection. And those were on display in Edinburgh for that period of time. And now there's this book. So anyways, I did order it from Amazon. It is coming from the UK. So um, I'm hoping it will be here. It should be here before anything happens with us doing anything. <laughs> so we shall see. But anyways, I do appreciate your input. Um, another little tidbit on samplers. And again, I am learning as I go. So I appreciate any input that I get from you, you all. And what I'm going to talk about here is actually something that Jacob de Graff, I think she, he actually does say his name, Jacob. Jacob de Graff um, of Modern Folk Embroidery talked about, he did, a, he did a question and answer video. I don't think the last one, but maybe the one before that. Very, very interesting to hear his background and his thoughts on things. And um, what I wanna talk about is actually something that several of you mentioned in your comments to me that being that um, you have to be careful because I guess this kind of spins off on my idea of us current day people stitching samplers that are reproductions from the 1700s, 1800s and people 200 years from now finding them. How do they know that it's not an original sampler as opposed to a reproduction of a reproduction? or a reproduction of an antique sampler. You understand what I say, I mean, right? Um, and so I guess there are people out there today who are stitching samplers, possibly, possibly these ones that have been reproduced, and um, roughing them up, staining them, and trying to sell them as original antique samplers and basically you know, trying to get a boatload of money for them and scamming people. People today, right? I wanted to, and, and Jacob says in his video that one way to determine if what you have is an antique is to simply, if there's a name on it, right? Um, is to simply search on that name. Because if you have a name like Ann Dale and you search on it, you're gonna come up with a boatload of not only places selling that pattern, but also um, people stitching it and floss tube videos showing it, that kind of thing. You know, we have quite an extensive historical record being produced of samplers that have been reproduced. Um, so chances are, if it is something that is out in the public as a reproduction, a sample, a reproduction sampler, um, you're going to come across it. And then of course you can look at the picture and see if that is indeed the one you have. So you can know, be, excuse me, know before you buy kind of what you have. Now, of course, in my case, there is no name on my sampler. And so that doesn't leave me anything to search on. So I can only go by the eBay seller that I got it from. She has hundreds of products in her store. She is a textile specialist. So she specializes in antique textiles from all over the world. Um, and she has hundreds of positive reviews. So she has a hundred percent, in fact, um, is her rating on eBay. So that that's the kind of thing I look at when I, you know, when I come across a sampler like this that has nothing I can search on basically. So I do appreciate you guys talking about that with me, informing me about that and making me aware that there, you know, there's there's scammers out there and we need to be aware of them. The other thing I want to thank you guys for is making me aware that um, the maker of my sampler was most likely a Spanish speaker. Let me get my little my little whiteboard here on which I have a ton of things piled. So many of you, not many of you, several of you pointed out that the double L 
and the double N, well, the double L especially, is um, Spanish, duh, yeah. Um, and then the N, if you look closely, and I totally didn't even notice this, if you look closely over the second N, there is a little, some extra stitches there that are meant to be the tilde in Spanish. Now, I'm kind of kicking myself for not glomming on to that because I was a Spanish minor in college and I am actually currently brushing up on several of my languages in Duolingo, Spanish being one of them. So thank you to all of those, all of you who um, brought that to my attention very much. We are talking, we are working here with a Spanish speaker, whether, and of course then also the, the sampler that Anne has that we thought said for Carmen on the bottom. The alphabet she used for that is actually one of the ones higher up on the sampler. And if you look at the F and you look at the P, you can see that it is a P down below. So por Carmen. Um, por can be mean for, but it can also mean by. So that is by Carmen. And in looking at it a little, a little closer, hers is actually done on a, on a lower count of fabric. She believes it's a 28 count, um, just with a cotton floss. She believes that that was a beginner stitcher, um, practicing her alphabet, practicing um, different stitches. There is some four-sided stitch on that one. Um, I posit that this is a mother and daughter, that the by Carmen sampler was the daughter and what I have, which is a much more sophisticated um, stitching, is the mother. That's my story and that's what I'm going with. I'm still gonna name that sewing box sampler one and then sewing box sampler two will be by Carmen. Um, but yeah, I was, I was just tickled to death to get that information. So thank you to all of those that shared that with me. All of you who shared that with me. Okay, so I think that is that. One other topic I want to talk about real quick um, that came up, I've mentioned before, I believe, that on Facebook there is a Facebook group, a private Facebook group of designers, and it's a place where we can share our ideas, um, share input on how to promote ourselves, even share things like where to get business cards and the bags you put your patterns in, you know, anything. It's also a place where we share information when we've come across copyright violation issues. And um, Deanna Carter of Cherry Hill, let me make sure I'm getting your name right, Deanna. So Deanna Carter of Cherry Hill Stitchery um, posted something from Cross Stitch Unlimited where somebody had posted their finished design and somebody else, you know, a picture of it, and somebody else, um, you know, they posted a picture of their finished stitching of, it wasn't one of Deanna's designs, but it was somebody else's design. And somebody else said, oh, that's so pretty, where can I get it? And somebody else responded and said that, um, well, if you can't find it, you can always just take the photo and expand the photo, zoom in on it, and just stitch from the photo. That's what I do oftentimes. Really? <laughs> I've talked to you guys before about um, copyright violation and how that really hurts the designers. Um, you know, the pattern is the cheapest part of stitching, usually. If you're talking about a small enough pattern that you can zoom in on it and stitch from the pattern, it just blows my mind. Number one, that somebody would say that that somebody would do that. I mean, spend the $6 and buy the pattern. I, I'm sorry, I'm just, I am so offended by that kind of thing. We put a lot of work into our designs and to have somebody just outright blatantly on a huge cross stitch group like that say, ah, just blow up the, the photo and stitch from that. People don't do that. You are stealing from the designer when you do that. 
it just that's a soup soapbox for me I hope you don't do that I I hope that most of you have enough respect for the designers and what we do that you don't do that and that you certainly don't encourage other people to do that it just Anyway, got that off my chest. Let's move on. Let's talk about stitching. All right. All right, let's. Let me see, what do I start with? So I spent a little bit of time, you know, my plan had been to spend some time every Sunday working on my silk gauze pattern um, by the Heart's Content, Maureen Appleton. I've only worked on it one one hour this past Sunday. So I started on the flower pot on this side. I got a good chunk of it done. So this is 40 count silk gauze. The silk itself is Soie d'Alger. It is a kit from Maureen Appleton, like I said, The Heart's Content. Stitching on silk gauze is a whole nother ball game. <laughs> um, I can't work a long time on this anyways, but um, I do, like I said, this is, like I've said before, this is my oldest whip and I would absolutely love to get it done this year. Um, any progress I make is progress forward, right? So even if I don't get to it every Sunday, I am making progress. It is out and seeing the light of day, and that's always a good thing. So I will link Maureen's website below. Um, she has several of these. You can see this is Silk Sampler Series 4. There's me practicing my Roman numerals. I'll talk more about that later. Um, so I'll link, I'll link her website below in case any of you, I know there's somebody else on my Facebook group who is working on one of her silk gauze projects. There is somebody else too that I haven't seen who's working on this one as well. Um, I haven't seen a post, an update from them recently, I don't think, I don't remember who it is. Um, you know, I always look around trying to figure out where I'm gonna put stuff. Um, so I've also on StitchCon weekend, I guess the reason why I didn't work on that is because I did do a new start for myself on StitchCon weekend as a kind of a consolation since I couldn't go. And that is Jeanette Douglas's Stitch What You Love. This is a new release in from this year's Needlework Expo market. And here is my progress on that. So I'm stitching this on a 36 count. This is the under the sea fabric. Um, I don't know the name of it, unfortunately. And I am using my own choices of Vicki Clayton hand dyed fiber silks. Although one of the reds This darker kind of softer red is a thread picker silk. So, starting to work on the house up here. There's the roof. This isn't getting much attention this past week either. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second because I'm working on my own designs that I want to get done basically. Um, I did change the spacing on the word a lot. Now, one of you did comment when I showed this the other week that the spelling of that was wrong. And you know, I think I grew up spelling this without a space in between, but now um, anytime I do type the word a lot on, you know, my wonderful iPad, autocorrect always corrects it and puts a space in. So there was room here to do that, I just moved the and over a little bit and put a one space fewer in between the words and it fit. So 
there you have it. This is a fairly small stitch working on the separate little motifs here and there. I will get this done in the not too distant future, I think. I don't know when I'll get it finished. Mike and I talked about whether I should try and get stuff finished, you know, framed and that kind of thing while we're still here. And I decided not to. Um, well, he helped me decide because um, I think I told you guys when I found Harbor Haven and my little fractal, but Harbor Haven more so, in our household goods, it was, which cabinet was it in? I think it was in our, our printer cabinet. There was a door. They had taken out all the innards, all the doors and shelves underneath the printer in the printer cabinet. And they had, I don't know what all, I don't remember what all was shoved in there, but Harbor Haven was also shoved in there. It was long enough, you know, that it could handle it, but it wasn't wrapped at all. They didn't wrap it at all. Now, I'm not saying every moving, moving company handles things that way. And of course, we weren't there for the pack out. We had, had a friend doing a pack out. I will be here at the storage unit for our pack out here, having an eagle eye on everything. Um, but I thought we decided, you know, I'm going to keep things unframed for now. I have them in a, a bin here in the RV, all of the, the things I finished it in the past two years, basically. Um, and I'll start getting them framed wherever we land after, you know, all of this is said and done. So that way we don't have things we have to worry about being damaged in the moving process. So at some point, all of these things I've finished will get finished, fully finished even. Um, shoot. Hold that thought. Speaking of finishes, I have two to show you that I actually forgot about. <laughs> And it was just in the process of saying something about finishes that I remembered. Oh my goodness. All right, first and foremost, Bayun Cat. This is one of the reasons why I felt okay starting the, um, the Jeanette Douglas piece, Stitch, oh, Stitch What You Love. So Bayun Cat by Al Forest Embroidery. This is all the called for, because this is their kit that I got. So, very, very happy with my little kitty. Love those mice chasing across the bottom. So, thrilled with that. Again, I don't know when it'll get finished, but for now it is safe and sound here in the RV. And then um, Serendipity by Fat Quarter Shop. is done. So this is the called for Weeks Dye Works Floss, stitched on 36 count Midnight Hour by Color and Cotton. And I'm very, very happy with how this turned out as well. So yay, see I had a couple finishes. So I was allowed to have a new start. Besides, let alone my own design new starts. All right, before I get to those knitting, I'm still working on my shawl. This is the Knights Who Say Neat shawl. This is on, this is clue three. I think I'm about halfway through clue three. I love those little, those little bumpy things there. Still loving this, again, not getting as much I had been doing an hour every morning this week. Um, just didn't happen as much. Still getting a couple days a week though. That'll probably pick back up here, maybe. I don't know, soon. But designs, my own designs. So um, let me start with sewing box sampler. Guys, this is a big one. <laughs> This is gonna take a while, which is why I started something else smaller so I have something coming out in between. All right.
I, I'm in love with it. I, I, it's just, yeah. So top border satin stitches is done. That side border, Bargello, oh my goodness, what a gorgeous, gorgeous stitch. I am loving that. I don't know if I can get this over. This border over here with the blue and acru flowers is coming along. That middle border there, the flowers, so this is the one that only had a couple of blobs stitched here, basically. Um, so I came up with this, I found this kind of morning glory looking vine that I think mimics a bit what seemed to be on the original. Gives me, gave me something to go with that, that had that same feel. That swirl above the flower thing is done. That will be repeated under the flower thing and then we'll be starting with the alphabets. Bargello, I love it. It takes a long time to do. But I, it's, oh. So yeah, this is coming along slowly but surely. I pretty much work on this every evening um, for probably two to three hours at least, sometimes four, depending on when my evening stitching starts. I am stitching that in Vicki Clayton silks. There will be a DMC conversion in the chart. I have her silks tucked away very nicely in one of my Bitsy Bobs. So I really like using this because I have all the spools in here and then as always all my little bits over here on the felt. So that is working really well for um, Vicky's spools. So I don't, yeah, I don't know when that is going to get done. Um, it's going to be a while yet. I don't like putting out my patterns. I've thought on and off about putting out my patterns, you know, just the computer generated one version of it. I'm just not comfortable with that. I know a lot of people do it and it's fine. I just, you know, there's enough, maybe it's just that I'm a new enough designer. Um, but there are enough things that, I don't think that that's the case at this point. I think I've cleared up every thing on the sewing box sampler, but the next one I'm gonna show you, there's always things that I feel I need to change. And this is kind of why I don't use um, yet yeah, model stitchers because there's always things either, not just like stitches that when I've changed things in the program um, that I haven't cleaned up totally, but, oh, I don't like how that color looks. Or, uh, like on this one, that border is not working for me. I have to redo that. Um, added to the fact that I just love, love watching my designs come to life in the, the floss and the fabric. I love watching it all come together. There's nothing quite as good to me as that. So... The other one I've started is Ode to a Peacock. The fabric is looking very yellowish here. It's Graham Crackers from Kitten Stitcher Design um, tea set. So it is more of a grayish brown, I mean gray with brown, brown tints. So this, if you remember, is based on the vintage linen set that I got that I picked up at an antique store in Bernie, Texas. So there's that peacock. So I've made it my own by changing the colors to more whoop, peacock colors, creating a different frame. And then do you see that gray back there? So I imagine this peacock at the Taj Mahal. And the Taj Mahal has etched marble. Now it has inlaid like lapis and malachite and all kinds of different stones, but it has, you know, just an etched background to it. So I imagine him standing in front of this marble etched background. So that's why I used a gray that's kind of like a tone on tone 
can see I have a start on that beautiful tail flowing out behind him. This is stitched in Mrs. Seda silks because her silk colors were just perfect for my peacock. This is a 40 count fabric, so I am using one strand of silk. I will say this project has been fighting me the entire way. So I got it charted and I started stitching it and I started up here in the upper left as I usually do. And I got, well, 12% done on padding, Pattern Keeper. So a good chunk of the border up here done. And I was like, I went to bed that night and I was like, I just don't like that border. It is not doing anything for me. So the next morning I picked that all out. I recharted the border and I love what I came up with for the border. And I will say that this idea is based on the sewing box sampler, the kind of both the satin stitch border and the Bargello, although this is all cross stitch. So I love that. And I started again, but this time I started down in the lower left because I thought, oh, I wanna to get to the peacock sooner. I don't wanna to have to do the whole border to get to the peacock and see how he's turning out. I was sitting there stitching away. Mike was on the phone to, I think somebody he used to work with out in Hawaii. And I realized when I started, when I calculated the fabric, I did okay. But when I started, I started down too far and I didn't take into account that that tail drops below the frame. So I started the frame two inches up and forgot about the tail, leaving room for the tail. There might've been some swear words, quietly since Mike was on the phone. <laughs> so basically I just like, I just took my needle out of the thread, shoved that piece of fabric aside and got a new, luckily I have enough of this fabric to do multiple projects on and got another piece of fabric and started over. And then that evening, I was taking a drink from my water bottle. This was on my lap. And apparently I had forgotten how to drink because I took the water bottle away and drops flew out of my mouth. And I don't know whether you can see, there's a, a water stain there. It's not showing up on the camera as well. And a water stain over here. I wasn't starting again. And this one you can't really see. I was able to blot that one. And this one, once I get it framed, all of this is going to get folded under. Well, there won't be any of that extra fabric. And so that water stain over there is basically gonna be invisible. I'm loving how it turn, it's turning out though. Let me show you a picture. So if you remember, this was the, the main piece. And I don't know whether this was some kind of table decoration, I don't know. And then there were these two little pieces as well. And I haven't the faintest idea how these would have been used. But what I did was, okay, so I adapted the peacock. Let me show you. So that is what he's going to look like. So you can see that background is meant to be there, but the peacock is still the star of the show. So that is that one. And then um, with the two other pieces, I decided to create this as a freebie. Namaste. So that is Namaste in the Devanagari script with the, of course, Roman letters underneath. So that will be a freebie. They will both be released at the same time. So Namaste is not getting stitched before it gets released. I make an exception for freebies. Um, 
All right, so that is what has been keeping me busy since I saw you last. Let me check my notes here. Okay. Let me get this stuff out of the way. So I've continued to, um, I think you shopping retail therapy. So I have some goodies to show you. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, wait, before we go there, I have those other segments that I did this time. I almost forgot. So I'm going to start with tips and tricks. I have had several people who have um, been watching my Basics of Cross Stitch series. And for those of you that may be new to Cross Stitch or maybe have, are returning and want to brush up, if you don't know that it's there, I did do 12 separate videos. It's in a separate playlist called Basics of Cross Stitch, taking you from the very beginning of Cross Stitch the whole way through to more advanced stuff. Higher counts of linen, um, silk floss, how to handle silk, how to transition from Ada to even weave, um, lots of information in those 12 videos. So anyways, I've had several people watching those and um, one in particular asked me for more information on um, how to use a seam ripper, how to take out any mistakes that you've made. And unfortunately she had ripped a hole in her fabric with a seam ripper. So I thought I need to do this. I actually don't remember what I did in the basics of cross stitch series. I'm sure I covered it, but I need to do it again. It, it never hurts to repeat add on to, I might have a different way of saying things that makes more sense than what I said before. Um, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about mistakes in this tips and tricks segment. And I'm going to start by talking about, um, you don't always have to rip out. How to know when it's a good idea to take out your stitches and when you can just leave it be. So let's switch the camera around and take a look at that. Okay, so let's first talk about when you should worry about actually frogging a mistake, taking out something that you've done wrong. My advice is you don't have to take out every mistake you make. Some you can live with. Some, if they don't affect the overall pattern, there's no reason to worry about it. So I'm showing you meditation garden here and looking at all my little grassy pieces and little dandelions. That's what I consider them. Um, did you know that? Those are dandelions because every meadow, field, grassy area needs some dandelions. Um, and there's at least one of these that is stitched not according to the pattern. Does it matter? No. Not at all, because it does not affect the overall design. There is one of these, I don't remember which one it is, um, that I put an extra stitch in or didn't have enough, I don't know. And it doesn't matter because it does not affect counting. It does not affect placement of anything else in the design. So in that instance, don't fret about taking things out. Now, I did also make a mistake Mm, I think when I was stitching down here, I think I didn't, somewhere around in here or here, I didn't have an, an extra row. I, I skipped a row. And so when I got down to, I think the placement of something down here, oh, I know what it was. There was that that did affect the rest of this, like the entire half of the piece over here. So I had to take that out. But there was also this. And part of this was a charting issue. I actually just changed the chart to match my stitching. <laughs> but um, I think I needed to put start the green grass in line with this dark green of the maize and I was one down. So this line of grass was actually supposed to line up with this line of grass. It was supposed to be up one. I did not worry about changing that because again, I had already gotten this 
little walkway in. It just changed where this flower ran into the walkway. It just meant that this line didn't line up with that line, but nothing else mattered. It didn't impact anything else. And as long as I didn't use this line to count from, then it didn't matter. So it's those kind of things you have to think about. Is it going to impact the rest of the design or not? Let me bring up this one again. Sewing box sampler one. When I was stitching this leaf, I left, I only did, I did one fewer stitches on this next to last row here, this long row here. And so it meant that this line, the row of four, wasn't over far enough. It also meant that when I came down and started stitching this, these stitches didn't land in the right place. This line of four was over here too far and it was running in to this line of four, so there wasn't that space in there. When you have something like that, then you definitely want to take out and redo. Also, if I had decided to count from here, like if I was starting over here and I had counted from here, it would have thrown off my counting for the rest of the row. So it's those kind of things that yes, you definitely want to rip out and stitch again. So let's talk about how to do that. There are actually several different ways to correct errors. So, this is my second start <laughs> of my Ode to a Peacock. And um, again, like I had said, I started it too low. I could have ripped this out, but I was um, frustrated enough that I just got a new piece of fabric. I just didn't feel like dealing with it again. But it actually gives me a perfect um, thing to play with to show the different methods of ripping out stitches. So I have a thread here that is still attached. Again, I was so frustrated with it. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I just took the needle off and went and got a new piece of fabric. I just and put this away. I just didn't even want to look at it again. So I'm going to apologize for my big old um, band-aid here. I cut myself opening a can of cat food last night and I had a band-aid on all last night but it broke open again when I was getting a shower this morning and the last thing I want to do is take the chance of getting blood on any of my projects. That would make me mad. Okay so let's talk about the different ways of correcting, ripping out stitches. If you only have a few stitches to take out, like say I needed to have a third stitch here, or maybe I needed to bring that one down another one, and you just have a few stitches to take out, then yeah, you just want to, I'm actually going to raise the camera just a little bit because it's getting a little blurry when I pick up the fabric. then yeah, you can just take your, you know, just undo the stitches with your needle. So, right, just up and down again. The problem that happens with this, if you don't take the needle off of the thread, is that you do stand a chance of, of course the hard part is where did I go up, where did I go down, um, you do stand a chance of snagging the existing thread. And so, like for these ones here, these two that I want to take out, I pull the thread out of the way. Go down, and I do often look underneath to see, okay, where did I go up on this one? Because I might have done it a different way. You never know with me. So I'm coming up in this upper left corner. 
again pulling the existing thread out of the way so that I have less chance of snagging it, opening up the hole a little bit. Back up. See this one, I don't know whether I did these as single stitches or not. Okay, so then let's look at this. This one goes into this hole here where there is other thread existing. So I'm gonna give it a whirl, but Murphy's Law usually means that I catch a thread. That time I didn't, so we're gonna go down again. But let me, let me show you what I mean. Either I don't pay attention and I come up in the wrong hole, or I catch one of the existing threads. So let's say I come up here, or even I even go through the existing, you know, the thread itself. Of course, it's not gonna happen now that I'm talking about it. All right, let's just say I come up here. I'm not sure whether that's the right hole or not. It is the right hole. All right. But oftentimes, if you are trying to come up in a hole that has other threads in it, you do stand the chance of either getting caught or it's the wrong hole or snagging the, the threads that are there. And so I do recommend then taking the needle off of the thread and using that to pull it up through. All right, so that's if you just have a few stitches. If you need to take out, and I'm actually going to um, cut this thread off so it doesn't get in the way. Now, if you have more to do, Again, if, if I am just, say I wanna take out this gray section here, I could do it like this, the, where, I, where I just pull each stitch out with the needle. And if I am just taking out a small section, I am more likely to do that than to get out my seam ripper, only because I wanna make sure that I don't accidentally mess up anything that I'm keeping. I only use the seam ripper, and I'll, I'll be showing that in a second, um, if I have a, like this whole area to take out, when I have a lot to take out. I also, let me in inject in here also, usually if I'm only taking out a few stitches, then I keep the thread, but if I'm taking out a lot where that thread is getting pulled over and over again through the fabric, I'll just throw the thread away. I won't reuse it. But anyways, so let's look at this gray area that I want to take out. I don't know where I started. I don't know where I finished. So I flip it over and I want to take out the whole thing. So what I do, again, I don't know which one of these ends, these tails, is the start and which one is the end. So I pull them both out. And you know, you might have a hard time sometimes finding your ends, depending how closely you clip them, how well they blend in. Um, but you can see, I just, I just pull that little tail out from under where I anchored it. And I think that's the only ends. Now you will also see that I did use the gray to anchor the blue here a little bit. Looks like that's the only anchor and that's just a little bit. It's also going through the black, so that's not a big deal. That actually just caught. If I had other colors anchored in here, and actually that is a good reason to, as much as possible, anchor under what you're stitching instead of another area of stitching. I don't always do that. I mean, you can look here and see there's green anchored under the blue. It depends on what the situation is. But if I did have any of the other threads anchored under what I had to take out, when I was restitching it, I would just have to be very careful that I caught those stray threads, those tails from the other colors, and anchor them again. 
So again, I don't know which one of these is my start and which one is my end. Um, I have a feeling this is probably my end up here because it's away from everything, right? I anchored this down here when I started, probably. Um, so I'm gonna start up here and see which one comes out. That's where my tail is down there, so. And there you go. So again, I'm just gonna unpick these one by one because I don't want to use the seam ripper and take the chance of hurting any of the other stitches. Now, because this is a variegated or these all these flosses, this is Mrs. Seda silk again, um, they do have a tonality. Most of this I've stitched one stitch at a time, but not always. If I'm only do only have two or three to stitch in a row, I will sometimes go back and forth, you know, out and across. Um, so sometimes it's hard to know where to go next and you have to kind of pull on the stitches to see which one is the next one you have to you have to go to um if if it's a piece that is just you know back and forth rows then it's a little easier and you know you're stitching you know how you usually stitch um and so you'll have a fairly good idea of, you know, which one to rip out next. So again, I would say that the hardest part of this kind of ripping is just finding those tails, undoing, and, and if there were more threads in here, like I, if, if I had worked enough of an area that I had two or three tails, or two or three pieces of floss with tails for all of those, then I would just pull them all out. If the whole section had to come out, I would just pull them all out and then just figure out where to start. Now, one thing you never want to do is to try and start taking out um, at the beginning, at the, at the tail where you started the stitching from. So that was this one down here, this one here. I'm just gonna stick my needle up in here so I know where it is. You never want to try and undo from the beginning because obviously the the tail, the first stitch is the bottom one, right? It's your lower leg. So when you, I mean, you can take it out, but it gets to be a pain. It's much harder. And also, um, more often than not, those earlier stitches will have been pierced by some later stitches and so you have thread going through that makes it kind of impossible to pull it out. So always start, find the end of the tail and start from there. Okay, so there is that. I'm gonna take off this piece of linen that's bothering me and this little piece of floss so it doesn't get in the way. Okay, now let's talk about using a seam ripper. Use with caution. Use it carefully, use it slowly. As, I mean, if, if I were, I mean, you don't want to ruin a piece of fabric anyway, but if you know you're going to reuse the fabric, if you're going to start stitching on this again, just always use this with a little respect, a little caution, this is a tiny one. You can see, this is just a little tiny one that I got, um, I don't know where. I keep it in my notions bag. This is my little notions bag from Deborah Harry, Deborah Harry's bags. It has all of my little knickknacks in it and one of them is my seam ripper. So it has, you take the lid off, it has the seam ripper here. On the end is this kind of um, rubbery silicone, um, almost looks like a little beehive, doesn't it? That you can use whenever you're done ripping and I will show you that in a second. All right, so I'm gonna work on these stitches. I'll start on these ones up here so it might be a little clearer. I never try to rip the whole stitch out at one time. 
I always take it leg by leg. I may do a couple stitches, maybe as many as three at a time. Always keep that sharp point parallel to the fabric, never work so that it's pointing down. And I just gently slide it under, like I said, just the top leg. I never try and dig down to try and get that lower leg at the same time because I just, I'm afraid I am going to catch one of the strands of the linen of the fabric and accidentally cut it. So I just do that. Do these two up here. Do that one. And as you do more, the other threads around it do become looser. But again, I don't ever try to dig down and get that other leg. So now that I've done that, I'll turn it over. <clears throat> and again, always keeping my seam ripper parallel. And these, I'm being just very, very gentle. I'm not, I never try and dig down. If I can get, if I can get the um, thread, I do. If I can't, I don't. I don't ever try to rush this. So I loosen them up back there because I still have the other leg, the bottom leg to do up here. And then I come up here and get the rest. This one's attached to this down here, so I don't try and pull that too tight. So that was easy. Having those ones kind of separate from the, from the bulk of them makes it easier. So let's go down to this bigger patch. And again, I just try and get a couple. And if I don't even get, like this is a, a two-ply silk, I don't even worry necessarily about getting both plies. I am just very gently catching what I can on that top leg, one stitch, two stitch, maybe every once in a while I'll get three stitch, but I never try and push it. I'll do a little block like this. And if I feel any resistance at all, I stop. If I can't get under the, the floss, any resistance means I'm running up against something that I'll come back to that when it's loosened up some. So this is a, like I said, a, it's a slow process. It's a multi-step process. So I've come down here and kind of loosened up the top of those stitches. Now I'm going to turn it back over see what I can loosen up on this side. Again, just barely skimming across here to catch these threads. If I can't catch it, if I'm worried at all that I'm pulling on something I shouldn't be, then I stop. Back up to the top. Work on catching the other leg. And then pull out the fluff so I can see what I have. So that is how I do it. Just back and forth, back and forth, very slowly, very gently. This isn't something you're going to rush. This definitely isn't something you want to do if you're pissed off about it because <laughs> bad things could happen. All right, so get some more of the fluff out of the way. The end here, the kind of rubbery silicone end. Now this isn't a, a really good place to show it because there's not a whole lot to show, but oftentimes after you've ripped out an area, there's some fuzz left. So you use this to kind of clean up the fuzz. And the other thing that this works really well for is kind of closing up the holes that are created. Um, 
fell off. From whenever you take the stitches out, you know, there you can see where the stitches were. So you can use this, I'm coming back over here where I took the gray out, you can use this to kind of rub the fabric gently and it'll kind of put the linen back where it's supposed to be, basically get rid of those holes and leave it back like it was new so you can stitch on it again and there's no, no image left of what you've stitched before. So I hope you found that helpful. Please do let me know if you have any questions. I will link to a seam ripper probably on Fat Quarter Shop um, down below if you don't have one. Um, this is a necessary tool um, to have in your toolkit. So let me know if you have any questions. Now back to the rest of the show. Okay, I hope you found that useful. As always, if you have any more questions, anything you want me to clarify, please do let me know. And now, because I don't want to be the only one doing stitching therapy, or shopping therapy, excuse me, stitching therapy is okay. Shopping therapy is okay to a certain extent too, because I know I'm an enabler and I am proud of that label, proud to share the stitchy love. Um, this shop we are going to is a French one. It was shared with me by Robin Gallimore. Thank you, Robin. It is a stunner. So again, we're going to switch the camera around and we're going to go shopping. All righty then. Let's go shopping. It's been a while, right? I have a whole lot more on my list and I, I you know, you just got to take a break sometimes from, from things, but this one I had to be sure and show you. This one was shared with me by Robin Gallimore, so thank you Robin for sharing this one. Um, this is a French designer, I wonder if she says her name someplace, let me see. Um, Stitching Fairy, so let's go back. Let's go back to items. Let's go back to the thing. I'm going to totally butcher this French. Atelier Fay Brodus. I don't know whether that's how you say it or not. She lives in Lyon, France. She's been on Etsy since 2014. Let's go back over her, here to her about page. She has so many gorgeous designs. And you can tell just by looking at them that they're French. I mean, I don't know what it is about the French aesthetic, but you know when a design is French, don't you? Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Come back here. Oh, for heaven's sakes. So she was obviously displaying at a show here. Tale of the Stitching Fairies Workshop. Stitching Fairies Workshop was born in, born in November 2000 and the blog's 10th birthday is in April 2015. I love the spirit of the American pictorial samplers, the naive style, the literature, the journeys, France and Italy, animals, gardens, houses, and sophisticated accessories, and my creations are the reflection of my tastes. That's awesome. Wait till you see. Marie Lagois. I don't know if that's how you pronounce the last name or not, but designer owner. So, I think you're going to like what you see here. If I can get this to work for me. Wrong buttons, all right. She does have a lot of very, um, very sampler-esque. She also has a series here called Samplers in Gray. All samplers are gray in the dark. <laughs> I love that, I just think that's awesome. So she has, I think I counted or, or noticed, the because she numbers them, this is number one, um, 15. I don't know that I saw them all on, on here, but they are all just this stunning. Stunning, stunning, stunning. So, stay tuned for more of those. She has a lot of garden type samplers. And this really reminds me of my um, Meditation garden, actually. Look at that, a sweet little place to sit and stitch in your garden. Maybe I need to make a stitcher's garden. This is called Chart Medieval Enclosed Garden. Now, um, 
she does say on all of hers that um, while what this is selling is the hard copy, she does say on all of those, these that um, a PDF edition is available for customers out of France, email her to ask for it. So while she does not have it listed here, um, she does have PDFs available. The other series that she has that I absolutely love are these ones. They are um, representing different areas of France, and I think also a couple in Italy, that are all like the sun. Let me see if she translates this at all. Kyrgios is in... I'm sure that I'm not pronouncing that right, is in the French Alps. So it's the sun over Kyrgios or something like that. She also does some of these purses that you can see are like houses, little shops. I mean, how cute is that? Isn't that wonderful? I don't know that the pins or anything come with it. Cross to chart and how to do the necessaire, not a kit. So this is just the chart. So anything that goes in it, you'd have to have yourself. Anyways, I'm gonna just start scrolling through here. So here is the chart. Oh my goodness. French Southwest Sun, Rouaguay, I don't know. Under Rourguet French Southwest Sun. How wonderful is that? Look, sheep in the pasture, little beehive, little kitty, goats. Oh, that's so pretty. So Autumn Sampler, she has a, a Noah's Ark one here. Light isn't real good on this one. I think the zebra's missing his companion. Guess it hasn't made it there. There, that light's better. That's pretty cool. Oh, the sun on Mount Ararat. So, of course, all of the words are in French, but I'm sure we could figure out how to translate it if we needed to. She does have a few that are reproductions, and this is one of them. Now this one, I believe, let's see. A reproduction of an original French sampler in my collection. If you prefer digital edition to avoid shipping cost, please contact me. Isn't that basket of flowers gorgeous? Wonderful. Now, she also has a very interesting series, I guess, of different villages. So you'll notice this is Provence Village, the chimney sweep. Here is the doctor. Remember those under the Provence sun. I love that. Even if it has people, the grapevines, that chateau is gorgeous. The gate is wonderful. Love it. So that whole series is just amazing. Oh, look. So here's one for Christmas under the star instead of under the sun for the nativity scene. How cool is that? And these, these characters really give me a feel of, um, I don't know whether I'd say Italian, maybe the different regions in France. This is very Basque to me down here. Anyways, that is very cool. All kinds of things going on on that. Under the Mont Saint Michel sun, Again, all kinds of purses. Here's another reproduction. 
This one is also really cool. Isn't that lovely? And this might be the one. One of them she talks about GGR. Yes, the antique stitch piece of work belonged previously to my dear friend Gigi Reese and is in my collection since August 2015. So I dedicate my reproduction to Gigi. Isn't that gorgeous? So here we go. This is the other village, St. Armar Village, Gar Gardener's Cottage. So she has these different charts and each of them, look at the kitty, that's Sasha on the roof. Um, each of them is a different part of a village, but she doesn't actually show you how to put it together. It's kind of like you can do it however you want. Another under the sun, under the Tuscan sun. That's gorgeous. Mm -mm. Garden with the goose. Here's another one of the gray ones. Isn't that gorgeous? under the Italian lake sun. So this, I think, was supposed to be set on Lake Cuomo. White peacocks. Isn't that something? Look at that house. That is gorgeous. I love this balustrade at the front. Mm. So another one of the gray ones. <clears throat> That's gorgeous. Oh, so well done. That one's number six. So this is what I mean, the, um, the village. So here's another part of the St. Armar village. How cool is that? So again, I, I don't know whether this is a bunch of the separate things all put together and you can still get them separately. Scenery one, do them as rows. I mean, there's so much to look at in this St. Armar Village scenery four. So maybe they're meant to be four rows. So cool. Makes me wonder if she lives by this village sewing machine another one of the gray ones she has um, a lot of the welcome ones too for the different seasons welcome to Paris bienvenue So here's the Provence village, the wedding one for Provence. And so I'm sure it's showing the different type of, um, you know, dresses that people would wear in the different parts of the country. The gypsy camp, huh, interesting. St. Armar village scenery six. So cool. And I, I don't, I ha haven't seen anywhere where she really talks about what her idea is for these. And I guess it's really what, what you want to do. That's a pretty one, isn't it? You know, how you want to lay them out if you wanted to do all of them or just a few of them. And then like the separate things. So you can see, I mean, there is so much here. She's obviously been designing for a long time. Here, this is gray number nine, or no, 11. I need to brush up on my Roman numerals. I mean, it just keeps going on and on. Under the berry sun. Oh, look, there's a piano out in the 
out in the yard <laughs> under the Normandy sun. How pretty is that? Oh, that's gorgeous. Mm. So anyways, I will have this shop linked below if you want to check it out more closely yourself. I think it's lovely. So you can see that the here's the Provence village, here's the St. Armour village with all the different things separate so you could build your own. She has little cozies for a tea box, a tea tin. I mean, there's sampler, gray sampler number four. So yeah, lots and lots to check out here. And like the different, okay, so here's a bunch of trees. Here's some cows. So if you were building your own village and wanted to add your own things to it, you could buy all these things separately and basically design it yourself. Isn't that cool? Number eight. Oh, here's 14. So yeah, she she's really working on the, the gray ones, which are lovely, lovely, lovely. So anyways, I hope you enjoy Provence Cowboys. <laughs> How fun is that? Um, I hope you enjoyed this little look at this shop. Again, there's so much here um, in the vineyard. So... Um, I hope you'll come back. It will be linked below so you can check it out a little more closely in a little more detail because there's a lot more to look at. All right, let's get back to the other part of the program. Okay, did you see anything there you have to have? I think her work is gorgeous. She has so many really cool ideas. So I hope you enjoyed that. And now my shopping. I have a couple piles here, and then we'll get to giveaways. So first is from my dear Raquel, Mrs. Sadus. She sent me a skein of her newest, this is so pretty, Summer, her newest colorway. So this is called Summer, and it is... Summer on silk. How about that? Isn't that gorgeous? Don't know what I'm going to use it for, but it's actually calling my name quite loudly. Oh, that's so pretty. And kind of along that same line, that same theme, this month's pin club from Fat Quarter Shop is called Citrus. Again, I didn't take these out. Now, I did see an email that the Just Another Button Company pin club um, is going to change. I think it was to once a quarter. So I think this was actually the last um, monthly one. Aren't those cute, though? And wouldn't that look fantastic with that floss in something? Awesome. Thank you, Raquel. So there is that. Crinkle, crinkle. All right. Um, let me share this one with you first. I signed up for Misty Purcell's newsletter, Luminous Fiber Arts, um, just in the nick of time. I think I saw something on Instagram that she was planning on having a, she's starting a, she's going to be doing a Christmas in July thing. I thought, I want in on that. I'm not doing Christmas in July myself. I did it last year where I did all Christmas designs, Christmas um, stitching in July because I like the idea of Christmas in July and getting started early on things. But I'm not going to, I have too many other of my own designs I have to work on this year. But Misty is doing a mystery stitch along called Jingle Jolly Joy. Now, she had kits of her hand dyed fabric and the, um, the over dyed floss. 
The kit sold out relatively quickly. I think I got in as soon as she sent the email. Sign up for her newsletter. I will put the information below if you are if you want to make sure you get future ones. She was then doing pre-orders, a limited number of pre-orders for those that didn't get kits. I would say that the pre-orders are probably full now too because that was um, Sunday and Monday, I believe. But of course you can always buy the pattern. And so I invite you to join Misty and myself and I'm sure many other people um, on, Mis on Misty's Christmas in July mystery stitch along called Jingle Jolly Joy. Very cool, huh? Why not? July is a couple weeks away. Well, we're eight days from the 30th, I know that. The 30th is looming in my mind. Um, I wanna try and get Jeanette Douglas's done. And I hope to have the peacock done stitching by the end of the week so I can get that in the store. So that should clear me up for another new start on July 1st. And yes, my no new starts is falling apart a bit, but you know something? I don't really care. I've done so good this year, except for my own patterns. I deserve her an award. Okay, um, other stuff I got. These are a couple pieces of fabric from my friend Lynn. Um, Lynn has been gifting me from her stash um, 40 count, 36 count linen because she's having trouble with it. She's having trouble seeing it. So this is um, light sand. And I have a feeling this might be a fat half because I think this is a fat half. This is a gorgeous color. This is called frosted pumpkin. Now this is a fat quarter. It is so pretty. I don't know how it's coming through there. It's a very peachy, pinky, corally, frothy bit of goodness in fabric. It still seems a little yellow to me. Hopefully it's coming through a little bit better for you. It's gorgeous. Thank you, Lynn. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. I wonder how it would look. The colors for the fall seasons in lace is gonna be golds. Maybe. I'll have to see when I get them what it looks like on there. So, again, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. I am happy to take your hand off of gorgeous 40 count linens. I got Vicki Clayton's next set of variegated um, silks. Haven't opened those yet. So, let's see what we got in this set. I love getting these in the mail. So we're gonna start with Old Maid of the Poppy. How is that for a gorgeous red? Old Maid of the Marsh Farm. Is that what that says? I think so. You get me squinting without my glasses on. Gorgeous green. Old Maid of the Hair. I love this brown. Look how pretty that is. Old Maid of the Blue Skies. Oh, this is scrumptious. <clears throat> Old Maid of the Clay. Well, that's another pretty brown. Let me hold it up with that other one. Hmm, I might rip out the the uh, roof on the Jeanette Douglas piece and use one of these instead. Probably Old Maid of the Hair. That's a gorgeous color for a roof. Old Maid of the Owl. Ooh. So grays, can you see that touch of brown in there? Isn't that pretty? Old Maid of the antiquity. That's gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Another green, oh this is pretty. Old Maid of the Cactus. 
Look at the greens with a little bit of blue. That's gorgeous. Old Maid of the Lemon, get back here. Pretty yellows. Oh, she is a master at color, I tell you what. And last but not least, Old Maid of the Space. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh. Variegated Floss of the Month from Vicki Clayton Hand-Dyed fa hand Fibers. She also has a Solid of the Month. If you want to start getting her um, fibers and build up your stash of her solids as well. Solids is what I'm using in um, the sewing box sampler. It is basically the DMC equivalents. Okay. The other new that I got, and then I'll go to um, what I got, got off of Stash Unload is some legacy linen from um, Hobby House Needleworks in New York. Now I decided I wanted to, um, these are higher count, these are both 45, and I got these to see um, an alternative, well, when I was deciding what to use for the sewing box sampler, I knew I wanted a lighter color. Um, I had never, I ha don't have any legacy linen, so I wanted to see what these were like. So this one is Jersey Cream, again, 45 count. They come nicely surged in these brown paper wrappers, very cool. And then this one is um, Foxtail, Foxtail Millet. So it has a little bit more of a yellow to it. Again, 45 count, what I ended up choosing for that though was um, Winter White 46 Count by Seraphim. I just liked that it was just a little bit softer. There's just a very faint modeling to it that I liked. Um, it just, I, I don't know, just had a creamy, I don't know. It were, seemed to work better for me. So, but I have some, and, and those are both fat quarters from, um, I think they're fat quarters. Yeah. Hobby House Needlework has a great selection of fabric and they, they really finish it nicely before they send it to you. Okay. So I've talked about shopping therapy. Um, I need to stop. I need to back off. You know, it, it feels a little hole in the heart. <laughs> for maybe the five minutes or so that it takes to open the package and look at it. Of course, I'm not starting these anytime soon. I'm glad to have them. Um, they're kind of ones that I missed when I wasn't stitching, when I had that break from stitching, um, when my boys were little and when I was knitting more. But I've decided I need to just stop looking at Stash Unload. Number one, because um, if this job does come through, we're looking at probably three weeks before um, actual moving starts happening. And so I don't wanna have things get caught in the mail. I know three weeks is still a lot of time for mailing, you know, at least here in the US, but I just, I just don't wanna take the chance of anything getting lost. So that's number one. But number two, I'm spending an awful lot of money on charts that I may never stitch that somebody else is gonna to have to put on slash on loan. I mean, this is kind of my retirement fund, but I have enough now to last me. And of course, most of my stitching these days is on my own projects, on my own designs. So I need to just take a break. Having said that though, <laughs> wait till I show you what I got. <laughs> a couple from Reflet de Soie. I don't have many red samplers. Red samplers wow me as much as the next girl, but I don't have as many. So I thought I needed one. And of course, Reflet de Soie does a gorgeous job. So this one is called Ama Soir Cherie. Ama Soir Cherie. So to my dear friend, maybe. And then this one, oh, it's so pretty. I've had my eye on this for a while. Albertine Bourgogne, 1907. Look at those motifs. So these are like Berlin woolwork type of motifs, that 
border. Oh my goodness, one could have an orgasm just on that border. Did I just say that? <laughs> yes, I did. And that bell tower in the center? Oh, that is scrumptious. This will definitely get worked in the silk. Actually, it is charted in DMC and Saju. I don't know whether Saju is a silk or not. Retour du Nord. I don't know. But this will get done in some sort of silk. All right. The Drawn Thread Summer. I think I also got spring at some point here. That's the other thing I have to do. I haven't gotten, like all of these ones that I've gotten from Stash Unload, I have got to get them in my X-Stitch app because at this point I don't even know what I have. And that's not good. That takes time. <laughs> Sarah's Crow, Crows from Praiseworthy Stitches. I love the bottom border on this one. I love that kind of sunflower viney border. I don't think I'd get bored with that. I might get irritated. I think that one's really fun. So, wrought by me. A couple from Indigo Rose. Um, their patterns are just exquisite too, and so I was happy to get a couple of these. This one is called Catherine Ag Agnes. Um, water lilies and water flowers are the floss is called for. Um, again, I, specialty stitches and gorgeous silks. What's not to love? So that is Catherine Agnes, and this one is Patricia Ann. Again, specialty stitches and actually this is charted in anchor, but this will get done in, in silks. Um, looks like there might be some black work on this. And did, can you say band sampler? Remember me saying I love band samplers? There you go. Patricia Ann by Indigo Rose. This one I've seen several people do and I've always loved it, so I snatched it up when I saw it. Birds of a feather. No bees, no honey, no work, no money. I love that. Ink circles, namaste. Do you see a pattern here? So this is the chakras. And this I could see doing several times for myself and for my sons, because they are, well, especially my older son, who's a massage therapist. He kind of is into the mystical side of things, as is my younger son, although I don't think he's into the chakras as much. So, love that. Then I have a whole folder of stuff here. What's in the folder, Jan? Oh, isn't that pretty? This, um, you know, I don't know what the name of this one is. This is a Moira Blackburn, and she doesn't have the name of the samplers on the front. This is not a reproduction, though. This is one of her own designs, as most of hers are, I think. Pretty, pretty pastels. I love Moira Blackburn. It says CHS Design Area. So the initials are CHS. Let's see if I can peek in here and see a name. Country House Sampler. There you go. So that is that one. A bunch more Homespun Elegance, because I seem to really like their primitive look, even though I'm not very primitive myself. Purely Samplers, Patches of Christmas 2. Homespun Elegance. Homespun Elegance Virtue Samplers. Again, Band Samplers. Homespun Elegance Elegant Borders. Love this. Done in blues. Right up my alley. Homespun Sampler, Band Sampler. Homestead Band Sampler. Ugh. Do you see a theme here? Homes, homespun Elegance, The Sheltering Tree. This is very 
Jacobian, which I love. And then I did it. I got a couple of Hawk Run Hollows. Now I already have Spring. This is Christmas at Hawk Run Hollow. And um, I saw this finished at the Cross Stitch Store in Lancaster. Is it Inspired Needle? No, that's the one in Chicago, isn't it? <laughs> the one that I went to with Liz and Deb in Lancaster, they have this finished. And it might be over one or it might just be in a really high count of fabric. It was gorgeous. I didn't actually get the pattern then, so I have it now. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I love that song. And then I also got the Village of Hawk Run Hollow. See, retirement stitching. I am all stocked up. So that's, that's all of my goodies from the Stash Unload site. All right. And that brings us to giveaways. I feel like it was a long time in coming, huh? Lots to talk about today. All right, so last week we had, not last week, I know it wasn't last week, it's been a couple weeks and a couple days we have the kitty cat pattern, prim and proper, and I have not worked on my prim stitch series in that time, in a couple weeks. It's not calling to me as loud. I wanna get the Jeanette Douglas one done. But anyways, Love and Friendship prim stitch series number 10. I asked you to say something about cats in your comment. Viv's Crafts won this one. Viv, I will be putting a comment on your comment so that you can get in touch with me. And then fresh cut, I asked you to use the word fresh in a sentence. Linda Fisitola wins this one. Linda, I don't think I have your address, just in case. I might have it, but I'm gonna ask you to send it to me again, just in case. Okay, giveaways for this week. We are keeping with the Christmas in July theme because Misty rocks. So first we have Peppermint Lane from Fat Quarter Shop. Again, Fat Quarter Shop is so stinking generous. I love them. I hope you do too. Peppermint Lane. So my question for you for this one is, do you like candy canes? Isn't that pretty? So cute. And then we have a quilt pattern, Merry Making. So what I find interesting, so this is very red and green, right? But they have down here different it done in different colorways so it doesn't have to look like Christmas it can look like anything you can make it whatever color you want my question for this one is would you do merry making in the Christmas colors or something else and make sure you use the words merry making in your reply because that is what I'll be searching on so I would do merry making in the Christmas colors all right, guys, that is all for today, except the beloved angel card. And today we have an angel in white. And she says, live in gratitude, for gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? If you're always living in gratitude, then you're always realizing that you're always receiving things for which to be thankful. I am thankful for you. I am thankful that you are here, that you are sticking with me through this crazy journey, that you like a little bit what I do, um, some days more than others, but I like what I do some days more than others, <laughs> if that even made sense. Um, as always, I don't know when I'll be back. I kind of like the two week schedule. I did mean to do this on Friday, but because Juneteenth became a federal holiday, Mike got last Friday off, um, and I'd rather have him not here to do the, when I do the videos. It just, it's just more comfortable. 
Um, so I am planning on two weeks. Two weeks will put us, I mean, let me look at my calendar because that's getting, it's coming right up on the interview. No, that'll be after the interview. That will put us on July 6th, so after our weekend in Waco. So yeah, look for me around July 6th or 7th. I dearly, dearly hope I will have an announcement at that point for what our future holds. Please keep everything you have crossed for Mike that he gets this job. We are very excited about it. We're very excited about the area of the country that it's in. Um, so send up your prayers, send out those good vibes, cross all of your appendages, knock on all the wood, do all the things <laughs> so that this job works out. Until next time, know that I love you, know that I look forward to talking to you, and I will see you around the internet. Take care, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.